Uh, thank you very much, Doug. It's, um, lots of people do say that it's great to have someone uh, working on the fifth floor who has served. In fact, there are, there are three of us who have served in the regular army now uh, on the ministerial side of the fifth floor. But it's also a curse too, because you get people coming in to brief you on submarines or aircraft carriers or fast jets or sort of the strategic deployment of formations in the field. And they start the presentation with, you'll know from your own experience. And you're sort of sat there thinking, well, no, I can just about get a platoon into a woodblock to sort of be safe for the night. But, the, but my experience in the army never extended to, uh, to the grand strategic. And I found that um, whilst, of course, having half an idea what some of the acronyms that are thrown at you endlessly in the MOD stand for. The reality is, is having served gives you nothing more than an affinity with the armed forces. Um, it certainly doesn't mean that you have all of the answers. Uh, and so since being made Minister for Defence Procurement back in December, uh, I've been on a very steep learning curve, learning where defence has gone in the 10 years since I, I left it, um, and where defence is going. Um, before I get on to the, the sort of meat of the speech, I, I need to sort of recognise that over the last two months, I had visited Abbey Wood, I had spoken at Integrated Warrior last week, I'd gone up to a DASA event at Cranfield last week as well, I'd visited lots in industry and I'd met lots around main building who were all saying, James, what we need more than anything else is stability in procurement. Uh, that hasn't quite panned out. Uh, I have been moved uh, within two months of having arrived, um, and I know that many of you will think that is far from ideal. But Jeremy Quinn is a fantastic guy with an amazing brain. Uh, he has done some great stuff in government already, and I'm certain that government will now settle down. Procurement will get the stability it needs. I'm gutted that I'm not able to take that forward because I was really enjoying what I was doing. But Jeremy will be a fantastic Minister for Defence Procurement and I think the equipment plan and the responsibility to develop future capability within our budget is now in very, very good hands. Um, that's not to say that I am not absolutely thrilled to be Minister for the Armed Forces. The sort of one ministerial post beyond Secretary of State that you're aware of when you are a soldier is Minister for the Armed Forces. And to now be at that desk realizing that it's, it's me uh, is, is pretty cool. Uh, and I am hugely excited about what, what will come. Um, now, last week at Integrated Warrior, I sort of wrapped myself in the cloak of science and technology, uh, which was within the Minister for Defense Procurement Beef, uh, and sort of rampaged off into the design of the future force, um, which most definitely was not. Uh, and uh, I got away with it, which is good, um, but it means that this week I can sort of come back and reheat some of those um, themes that I explored at Integrated War and expand on them, knowing that it is now very much within my gift to do so, uh, and so uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. I should clarify, however, that this is only day two as Minister for the Armed Forces. Um, yesterday was my first day in the office, um, and so inevitably, these are mostly the reflections of somebody who's been in the MINDP office for the last um, two months. And this certainly shouldn't be, be seen as some sort of authoritative, perhaps not even particularly insightful contribution to the integrated review um, process. Um, what is clear, however, is that to help seize the opportunities that lie ahead as we redefine our global role, the government has set in train the biggest review of our foreign defence and security policies since the Cold War. The MOD, of course, is fully committed to the successful delivery of the government's ambition within the integrated review. And the Prime Minister has been clear that the review should be as open and as transparent as possible. To that end, we intend to consult widely with experts in think tanks, like our friends here at RUSI and in academia, and throughout the defence community, throughout the process, to help us develop our thinking and challenge our assumptions. Now, I would argue that that challenge comes in two halves, and I'll borrow CDS's language. Firstly, the challenge on sunset capabilities. What is the stuff that we can soon do without? And what is the challenge on sunrise capabilities? What will give us the edge in the future? And I'd like to return to the second of those questions shortly. First, however, uh, I want to say a little about why we're here today. Uh, as Minister for the Armed Forces, I must love all of my children equally. So this isn't a signal that Strategic Command has already won 
favour. Um, but it is right that Strategic Command joins the Army, Navy and Air Force in having a conference to explore the opportunities for their organisation. Um, previously, and this is being really unkind, it's never, ever, ever a view that I held, Joint Force Command might have been regarded by some as a sort of purple skip. The bits where the sort of difficult joint stuff go in the middle and there's a sort of function for it, but what was its role in the future of the battle? Um, I think it had all the right intentions. There was plenty of success in the things that Joint Force Command did, but things have moved on. JFC was about jointery. Strategic Command is about integration. And the two, in my mind, are indeed very, very different. Joint was the bringing together of our email, our calendar, our contacts, and our to-do list, the sort of old outlook. Integrated was making them speak to each other and to us to adjust our journey times because of traffic, or to order online groceries, or to make sure that the heating only comes on when you're 10 minutes away from home. It's Alexa. And so I'm going to... Uh, look at today's program, and Rusi and General Patrick have been very busy choosing very heavyweight titles for the sections of today's conference. Strategic integration, countering the sub-threshold activity, exploiting disruption. Um, I'm going to label it as something a bit different, something a bit more childish, but I think something that explains actually what we're about. Alexa, fight my war. Um, now, in June 2007, uh, something amazing was happening. Uh, it was the first time that I was under Patrick Sanders' command, uh, and uh, General Patrick was leading the Four Rifles Battle Group in Basra, uh, and we were having what was then the fight of our lives. Afghanistan thereafter became hairier still, but at the time it was very challenging. And when you think back to that battle and what was going on, uh, I was Patrick's RSO for the Regimental Signals Officer for the second half of the tour, and triumph for me was to give him the ability to speak to other people within the battle group. That was about the sort of limits of the technical demands of the chain of command as far as it went within that level of organization. To have a sort of down lean, because I remember the commanding officer had in his armored vehicle so he could see imagery from an unmanned aerial system, that made him a sort of god that he had that sort of integration between land and air. It was novel in the, in the sort of regular conventional forces, that was a novel capability. The idea InfoOps was sort of handing out leaflets or sort of saying to people after you had raided their house that we're really sorry and here's how you get some compensation. That was as far as it all sort of went. And we're talking about something 12 years ago. Now actually what happened that summer was not just that I got to serve under General Patrick, but also whilst we were in Basra that summer, something fundamentally changed. A new age dawned because the iPhone launched in June 2007. And that completely changed everybody's expectations about the amount of information you should have at your fingertips. People who were involved in fighting the battle overseas in Iraq or Afghanistan became quite impatient with the fact that they had more information at their fingertips whilst walking around in their hometown at the weekend than they did when they were out on operations. And so there's a sort of, there's, a, there's an osmosis where your experience in the stuff that you're doing as a civilian starts to raise your expectations. And I wonder how often that's happened in the past before. In the last century, Defence and NASA owned almost all of the boundaries of technology. We were the ones who were giving the patronage to the research labs, so we knew where those boundaries were, and we, of course, could be the first to exploit their te those technologies because they were ours. But in the information age, I think it's been the other way around. We've had commercial consumer tech in our hands, in our homes, and that has informed our thinking, and we started to look at how do you employ that utility within defense. Um, when you think that back then, just in 2007, Facebook existed, yes, but back then it was somewhere where you sort of uploaded all of your holiday snaps and you sort of expected your friends to scroll through all hundred of them, and that was, that was the totality of social media. There was no Twitter, no Instagram, no WhatsApp, no Snapchat. Google Earth was only launched in 2005, 
So having satellite imagery before you went out on a patrol, having any source of imagery was sort of, wow, this is amazing. They really think this is important. This is normally the stuff that only goes to SF. And yet now, it's entirely the standard. Being able to look at the Earth from space is just something you do in order to find out where the nearest Pizza Hut is. They, our whole expectation of the information we should have as civilians has totally changed, and with that, our whole expectation of the way we should use information in war has changed too. But what I find really interesting is despite that exponential change in our expectations around the information that we use in the fight, if you flew over the battle in 2007 or the invasion of Iraq in 2003, or flew over the battle in the Gulf War in 1990, or flew over the battle in the Falklands War in 1982, you'd still see broadly the same stuff beneath you. You'd still see planes that were triangles with engines with someone strapped to the front. You'd see big grey warships. You'd see tracked armoured vehicles operating on land. With it amongst those vehicles, amongst those platforms, the way that information flows has changed exponentially. William Schneider, the chair of the Defence Board, the US Defence Board, came to visit me the other week ahead of doing some stuff with the second best think tank in, think tank in town, Policy Exchange. Uh, and he, he was saying that between the first Gulf War of 1990 and the second Gulf War of 2003, the bandwidth requirements for similarly sized formations went up by 100 times. So you fly over the war, it looks the same. Grey ships, yellow tanks, grey warplanes, but the bandwidth requirements growing behind. And I reckon that if you came forward to now, you'd still see the same sort of thing. Triangular planes, tanks, grey ships, bigger ones. Um, they, but, the, but fundamentally, it's the same fight, just with, and what's changed is the way that the information flows between, the way it's integrated. And I think that that brings with it, to go to CDS's language around sunset, and to go to the bit of the equation that I don't want to focus on today because it's not really strategic command stuff. But it is very hard to look at all of the platforms we have at the moment and to know that for the last 30 or 40 years, we've probably been able to say that the battle is changing. Technology and manufacturing is changing. Autonomy is coming. AI is coming. All of these things have been coming down the track for a very long time, and yet the battle still looks the same. So working out what those sunset platforms are which are the ones that are missing from that picture when you fly over the battle in 2035 is going to take quite a lot of political bravery. And thank heavens it's not the land warfare conference, the air conference, or the navy conference that I've had to speak at at day two as Min AF. Um, because I think where we are today is that the battle that we're fighting is being fought very differently. It's no longer enough to have a battle-winning edge in terms of firepower. There's a responsibility to win the information battle around the war that you're fighting. It's no longer enough to have highly complex systems. You need all of the data that comes from that system, both about the performance of that system so you can support it better, but also from all the sensors on that system so you can join up all of that data, whether it has come from land, sea, air, cyber, or space, in order to get a better understanding of what the enemy are doing and what the opportunities are to exploit and win the battle. Um, now, last week, I made a challenge. I sort of asked, as Mindy P, but I think the challenge stands even now from the Min AF office, what is it that we're doing? And I characterize it as, are we, in our platform-centric militaries, blockbuster, about to be disrupted by a future fight that is Netflix? In which case, are we going to go out of business? Are we just fundamentally completely structured wrong in what we've got? Or is it a sort of disruption that is more Zipcar, Uber, Deliveroo, where the platforms, the business models, still look broadly the same, but the battle-winning bit is the speed at which everything flows around, the utility that you find for those platforms, the way that you sort of use those platforms in a way that you might never have conceived of before, but the technology unlocks the opportunity? I, I, I don't know the answer. But strategic command clearly occupies a very big space in the answer to that challenge. Um, now, this is an SCSR year, and so Patrick has sort of written out his shopping list, uh, which is there 
on page three of the leaflet that's on your seat. Um, and really, there are sort of three things in the strategic command shopping list, all of which are noted. Um, so firstly, cyber. It's obvious that we have to have both a defensive and offensive capability in cyber. We have to be able to uh, defend ourselves. We need to have a resilient home network. We need to understand that if war was coming, the first thing our opponents would try to do is disrupt our force generation by switching stuff off back home before we've even left to fight the war. We are being attacked, being attrited back home through cyber, and we need to be prepared to defend ourselves from that. But so too do we need the capability to do exactly the same to them. If they are in a force generation process because the war is coming, we need to be able to get thousands of miles in depth, switching stuff off, messing around with their digital architecture, their infrastructure back home, so that they can't get to the start line in good nick either. Clearly, that is a really important part of the future deep battle, a deeper battle than I guess we've ever been able to fight before. And with that comes a total rethink of the sort of people and the sort of skills we need in defense. I would be right at home as someone who always preferred a fry-up over a sit-up. Um, the idea that you now are someone who can have strategic battle-winning effect from your desk because you have an affinity with tech and you understand how to exploit stuff thousands of miles away to defeat your enemy, I think is a very interesting point. And it's actually absolutely right that it should come right at the top of the strategic command shopping list today. Then there's special forces. Uh, it won't surprise you to spot that I was never really a candidate for selection. Uh, I do know some good pubs around Brecon, but the idea of walking between them all uh, with very heavy things on my back to time was anathema. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we sort of back then when all of my mates from the rifles were off to do selection. Their dream was sort of crawling through the ditch with, we called them swords, but their dagger in their teeth, ready to sort of jump out and plunge it into the heart of the enemy commander, and that would be the SF Mission 1. Now we want them to sort of crawl in and plant malware in the heart of the enemy servers, and it's so much less glamorous and yet so much more devastating in the effect that it can have. Now, I should say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm in day two. They haven't trusted me with any privileged information yet about what special forces actually do. But in Hollywood, that's sort of broadly what they do, and it seems about right that the future of those sort of special operations is no longer about, probably still is, about precision kinetic, kinetic effect. But actually, that ability to get in and access our opponent's data, even when their system seems impenetrable from the outside through online accesses, Clearly, that's a capability that surely is at the heart of a future SF capability, even if it's so much less exciting than what people might have thought to be the role previously, strategically vital. And then there's the multi-domain integration stuff. And I, I worry that I will give General Patrick the new nickname Alexa, but that's sort of what this is. It is about how you bring all of the things together that have always been in your life. They've always been in the fight. But how do you integrate all of those things? Now, here in Whitehall, disruption is the zeitgeist. Uh, and I have a hero uh, when it comes to disruptive thinking. I have two, I should say. One, obviously. Uh, but the second is a guy called Luke Williams, who is a professor in, um, at the Stern Business School in New York University. And he heard him speak at a conference. I've read his book since, watched a lot of his stuff on YouTube. And really like, for me, his sort of idea that disruptive thinking comes down to invert scale deny. If you invert a business case, if you invert a part of a process, if you scale it or if you deny something that hitherto has seemed essential, you can come up with disruptive hypotheses that allow you to challenge the conventional. Some of those disruptive hypotheses will be completely nuts in order to embolden people to think the ridiculous. I was talking at the DASA event last week about plankton-powered rubber duck bombs. But why not? Who knows? You know, you just you can have millions of those. And Jerry will hate the fact that this is true, but if a million plankton-powered rubber duck bombs crashed into the Queen Elizabeth, she might sink. So, you know, we've got to think the incredible, invert, scale, deny. There'll be other disruptive methodologies, but that's the one that seems to sort of make sense to me. And I think it's right that we challenge ourselves. We challenge every single last bit of our thinking. Because it's no good 
sort of sitting here on the one hand and dismissing the tactics of the generals in the First World War for employing Victorian tactics of advancing to contact in line, or even sending cavalry charges into battle against machine guns and armor. There's no point sitting here saying how ridiculous that was if in the same breath we then refuse to challenge ourselves over what the future of war fighting look like and what looks like and what the platforms are that are relevant. Those who would have sat on the front row of the conference in 1914 would presumably have still been determined to find utility for cavalry or for advancing infantry in line. So let's be coherent. Let's acknowledge the folly of that. And in so doing, allow ourselves the freedom to be disruptive. Think not every, not every answer will be a disruptive solution. But let's at least allow ourselves the freedom to think the unthinkable, challenge every assumption we make about defense, in order to make sure that when we deliver our people into harm's way in 30 years' time, they can know and we can know that we gave ourselves complete intellectual freedom at this SDSR, the biggest since the end of the Cold War, to think again about what the future of defense looks like and how we give them that edge. And if, on behalf of the taxpayer, we can do that by finding the 10p solution for the £10 problem, rather than again finding the £10 solutions for the 10p problem, then we will have done both the Exchequer and our people and the people of the United Kingdom a huge favor. I'd like to finish by imploring you to participate fully in today's conference, participate fully in the SDSR that lies ahead. It's clear to me that finding the synergies, finding the opportunities to operate in an integrated way across all five domains, land, sea, air, space, cyber, is absolutely key to the future of the battle and to giving our armed forces the battle-winning edge they need. So enjoy today, enjoy this year. Alexa, fight my war.